Okay, we've opened in prayer. Why don't you all have a seat? It's good to see you again this morning. Good to see you too. Thank you. Well, we can say, as they said about Christ is risen indeed, we can say that he's come indeed. Amen? That he's visited every one of our lives and uh, he's manifested himself to the world. And so uh, we've come through a time where the world celebrates his coming. Of course, we celebrate his coming all the time because of what he's done in our lives. Amen? Amen? Because of how good he's been to us, how uh, he's kept us. Yeah. And when we talk about being kept by the power of God in First Peter there, what a blessing when we might let down, he still keeps us. Amen. We have a lot to rejoice in today as well as every other day. Amen? Amen. So this morning we're going to talk about the mountain of blessings. The mountain of blessings that's been in every one of our lives. And you may say uh, today, as I was writing a lot of these things out and going through some things, you may say, I'm really kind of sad. Here is everybody in the world is celebrating the birth of Christ and so on and family gatherings and maybe I'm kind of sad. I don't know if my life amounts to much or I'm worth much of anything. Uh, you know, everything seems to be just surface, um, sort of in vain or for no reason whatsoever that if anything happens to me, life goes on regardless. Uh, feel a little down about yourself and many people go through that this time of year and because they can't provide a lot of things that other people do and so on it can be very discouraging but that's what the Lord Jesus has done for every one of us in our lives he's given us reason to live reason to exist our worth and our value isn't about what we possess it's about who we know that we know the Lord Jesus. Amen. And so in him, he says, are all the blessings and the fullness of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And he, according to Scripture, dwells in our hearts by faith. So we're going to talk about a mountain of blessing today, and I want you to understand that anybody out there listening this morning, and those of you listening online, thanks for being with us, and maybe this applies to some of you, and maybe it applies to some folks who are right in the midst of us that everybody thinks is doing just fine. But it all comes down to who we obey. Amen. We can be blessed, or we can go through all these struggles in life. We can feel worthless, be in despair, be distraught. Or we can have the salvation of God and the goodness of God working in our lives. The mountain of blessings, we'll talk about it here in a little bit, but I want you to open your Bibles this morning to uh, Psalm 1. And you may say, well, how do I get these things working in my life? And it tells us right here in the beginning of the psalm. Psalm 1 says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he, the person who does these things, shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That word prosper means not financially. It means we mature, we grow, we are fulfilled in the Lord. We have our peace in him. Uh, we know who we are because of him. So many people are looking for identities, and that begins at early ages nowadays because everything is being uh, blasted in the airwaves. You've got to look like this person and dress like that person and walk this way. And, you know, uh, we used to be accused of being judgmental. 
But the people who accuse you of being judgmental will say that if you don't poke your hair up this way, and if you wear a suit and a tie, we'll never listen to you. And that's all judgmental while we're accusing people of being judgmental. And so in all of these things, he says, blessed is the man. And do you notice he starts off showing you some negative things that you don't walk in the way of the ungodly. He talks about how we walk, how we stand, and how we sit. It all has a lot to do with where we are in life. Our perspective, our place, uh, our followings, what our lifestyle looks like, how we walk, how we stand, how we sit. That's most of our lives. Walking, standing, sitting. And then he tells us, of course, we're not to be asleep as the world is because that takes at least a third of our day in sleep. Blessed is the man. Do you want to be blessed in life? We can go to, you all know, Matthew chapter 5 and read what Jesus said when he gave his Sermon on the Mount. Blessed is he and blessed are they and blessed are you as he goes through the uh, first parts of the sermon there. The part everybody wants to read and about being humble and about being meek and about, uh, you know, seeking the Lord and uh, desiring his coming. He says we're blessed. That's the way we walk. That's the way we sit in things. That's the way we stand in this world and the life that we're in. So he says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Uh, you know, the counsel of the ungodly tells you you have to have this face. You have to put on this front. You may be totally depressed, but you have to be totally positive when you go out there in the world. You have to show them that you're somebody and that you're something. And in reality, we don't have to show that to anybody. Amen. The greatest thing is when that's what's living in us, that we are somebody in, the, in Christ. He's made us who we are. We're no longer striving for position and authority or, you know, success or striving to be somebody because we inwardly feel like we're nobody and nothing. That's the greatest life we can have. That's why so many people are out here throwing themselves in drunken stupors and getting high and throwing themselves in lustful uh, relationships and giving themselves away sexually when they really never wanted to. They had this imagination, this is going to make us. And back in our day, it was you drove by that sign on the freeway which showed this woman in a long black sleek dress with blonde hair and she was attractive and it said drink black velvet and you can have this and so what do people do they start going to the bar they start going to this they start going to that they dress this way they put on a cowboy hat uh, because you know everybody uh, loves my pickup truck as the country <laughs> song sings and so they put on an identity which they never grew up in, which nobody in their household or family was a part of. I know we celebrate in the coming of the Lord. What did he come, us, come to do? He came to set, as it says in Isaiah 61 and Luke chapter 4, to set the captive free. We were captive to all these things. And Christ has given us freedom. Somebody may not like you the way you are, but be who you are. Now, if that's crabby and rude and everything else, get in the scripture because Jesus will tell you how you should be. Amen. So we don't walk after that way of the world. We don't stand in the way of the world. So our counsel and our advice may sound nothing like what people in the world tell you. You may remember when I talked about a youth pastor that told the kids in his classes that as long as they didn't touch each other below the waist, it was okay. Find that for me in the scriptures, please, that you would give somebody an opinion like that and what you would tell people. There's none of that there. That's the counsel of the world. Go sow your seed and somewhere along the line, you know, try the shoe on before you wear it. You know, which talking about shoes and things, how many of you got gifts for Christmas? 
Almost everybody got a gift from somebody. Amen. How many of you already have decided to return something that you got? Well, we got a couple things at our house, and I want to thank all of you uh, that gave us gifts from the ministry here. I appreciate it very much that you'd even think of us. Uh, it's been a real blessing. Um, I guess I should tell you, you know, there's a gift that you never, ever want to return. The Bible says the gift of God is eternal life. Don't give it back or take, send it back for any reason whatsoever. You'll be so glad you did, that you kept that one. The gift of God is eternal life. We know the wages of our sins is death, right? That's a paycheck for what we've done, but the gift of God that we never want to return is eternal life. So today, there's a way out of your sadness, there's a way out of your dilemma, there's a way out of your feeling uh, that you're nothing or that your life has no value. And you may have already thrown yourself into a lot of things. You may have already closed a lot of doors of your heart. But there's a way out of all of that through Jesus Christ. Through the work of the cross and the blood that was shed for every one of us, that's how we've gotten where we are. And are we perfect? Of course not. But we still are called to preach and teach this word. And he said, by the foolishness of preaching, he will save men's souls. By the mere fact of somebody bringing the word of God to light in somebody's life and speaking it and declaring it and standing on it, walking in it and sitting down with it, as the Bible says, He'll deliver people from their troubles. All they have to do is be those that are called blessed, as you and I are. That word blessed means full of joy, full of happiness. Oh, how happy are they, as it denotes in the terminology, who follow the Lord. Amen? Amen. Yes, you have days you're a little bit grieved over someone went home to be with the Lord or something didn't go your way. But listen, don't ever stay there because that's the work of the enemy. There's times and seasons for all these things in every one of our lives. There's times when we may feel like a failure, but that doesn't mean we are a failure. And in the Lord's eyes, the Bible tells us because we are blessed of the Lord, Psalm 1, that he will cause even what looks like our failures to work to our good if we are walking after the Lord. Amen. So while we're right there on blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, I want you to go back to Deuteronomy chapter 11. And I don't want you to stop bringing your Bibles and flipping pages just because we're putting scriptures up here on the screen because that's for folks maybe that are guests that may not bring a Bible and carry it about. And if you have to look up there, that's fine, but you should still take time to look some of these things up. So in Deuteronomy chapter 11, and you'll probably remember this if you know some of the scripture and so on, if we get to verse 26 through 28, and I'll read this because as they were on their trek through the wilderness, God was showing them that I'm going to bring you to the promised land. Moses is leading the people, and God is making it known to them that there are some things that they're going to have to do. So in 1126, it says, Behold, I set you before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. Anybody remember we have some commandments? Next week, I'll have it in here. We've got a uh, little modification, I guess, of what the commandments look like on stone that will set in here. It's big enough that you could probably read them from where you're sitting. 
He said, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God. Do you want to be blessed? Do you want it to be that in your season you bring forth fruit? Do you want it to be that uh, you're like a tree planted by the rivers of water? You want your leaves to flourish? You want to look good? That's why I don't have gray hair. <laughs> it's not because it's the blessing. It's because that's a desire, though. You want to look like you got uh, everything together for as long as you can. And I know some of that uh, we don't have anything to do with. I couldn't tell you in any way why I might have some hair where you don't. Nothing to it whatsoever. It might be in the genes. It might be in the foods you eat. It might be in the vitamins you take. It might be some of the blessing of the Lord uh, in that sense. I know I have always told people ever since I quit drinking and smoking those cigars, which I was only a kid then, but had I continued, I wonder what I would look like now because it could be quite different. As I watched a lot of my friends that maybe never came to the Lord that lived those type of lifestyles, they looked a lot older than I did and so on. But then again, some of them lived those lifestyles and didn't look any younger or older than I do. And I don't think that I look that young whatsoever or, uh, you know, like I'm beautiful, I'm not vain or any of those type of things. I'm the guy who always wondered why my wife would even stay with me when we were younger. Amen. So he said, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing if you obey the commandments. Wow, that sounds so easy. Isn't that, doesn't that sound easy? Yes, all we have to do is when we hear it, listen and do it. That's all we have to do when we hear this word preached. Do you remember this word is quick and powerful? According to Hebrews, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Amen. It divides the soul and spirit. You know, I'm having these emotional things and uh, these mental images and everything else. That's all soul. He says he divides the soul and the spirit. We talked about Mary and Elizabeth, or excuse me, Mary and Zacharias, both hearing from the angel of the Lord. Uh, we have to make sure we're actually hearing the Lord if we think somebody is speaking to us. And if it's the Lord, it's going to go along with the word. Because it's the word that is life, right? It's the word that is truth. It's the word that was Jesus come in the flesh. So he said, I set before you a blessing and a curse. And listen, uh, there's a lot of folks that sat and listened and were instructed in what to do who turned a deaf ear, who said, I will not submit to that. Well, it's only the word of God. If I preach to you like I did uh, just in a little bit, we did on uh, Friday night that there's an area that John came as the forerunner of Jesus and said, repent. And I say to somebody, you might need to repent. Well, they could turn to me and say, well, you did this and you did that and all these other things. But in reality, they still need to repent whether I was guilty of anything or not. Because none of us is perfect as yet, as yet. But we see somebody who's living now in a life of sin or has gone into a life of sin and then wants to return to the Lord. There's some things we have to do. It's not just because I say so or you say so. It's because the word of God says so. So he's saying, if you obey him, you have a blessing. How many things do you think or can you think of that you might say, you know, I disobeyed the Lord. And look what went wrong because of it. It doesn't mean he's hostile toward you, but he has things and principles in place that if you go this way, these are the things that are down that road. And so we kind of bring those things on our own selves not that he desires any man to be cursed he would that we all be blessed in the knowledge of the word and the truth so a blessing if you obey the commandments of the lord which i command you this day and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the lord your god but turn aside 
Remember, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. He doesn't stand in the way of them that they stand or sit in the seat that they sit. He said, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day. And so in this, we see we're blessed if we really walk according to the Lord and obey his commandments. And on the other hand, we're not going to be blessed if we turn aside out of the way. And I hate to say it over and over again, but a lot of the churches, the leadership is turning aside out of the way. They're taking people into other areas and people might get mad that you say that. Why do you talk about other churches? Well, we're going to find out down the road here who the church is that God raised up. And when I say that, I don't mean, oh, we church at Warren and nobody else. No, I mean, there's going to be church here, church there, church over there. Could be church down the street, could be church a mile and a half, two miles away. Could be in Chicago, Detroit, anywhere else that are going to rise up as truly preaching the gospel and standing in the truth and not going out of the way and serving the counsel of the ungodly, sitting in the seat of those who scorn the things of God and stand in unrighteousness. Does that make sense? And so in that, like we talked about on, on Friday night, preparing the way of the Lord, preparing for the coming of the Lord, we have all got to be facing these things. Get out your mirror that's in the book of James and take a look at yourself and say, how am I living? Who am I following? What am I obeying? Am I keeping the commandments of the Lord or am I going out of the way? Because when we get to that, I dismiss all that stuff. We've all got to look at this as we go. Do you think I wouldn't like to see the pews filled? And I guess I could do what other folks maybe do to fill pews, or, you know, I could put out the cards in the neighborhood. How would you like church to be? Like some have done, and then we'll do church that way. And if you want a rock band up here, we'll have a rock band. And if you want to come in your uh, PJ pants, you know, when we do the PJ night at the church, and the pastor comes in his PJs and I'm sure Jesus came out in his PJs and so did the disciples because they wanted to fit with society. Oh, yeah. So the pastor's up there preaching a message in his pajamas. Well, we were always teaching people, you don't come out of your private places, your intimate places, with your pajamas on or in your skivvies. And you don't share your intimate details between your husband and your wife with the dudes down at the corner or at the gym. Amen. Amen. That's your private relationship between you and your wife or you and your husband. And the girls don't share all that kind of stuff at the baby shower. Because it's intimate. It's to be between me and her or her and him. And it's not to be broadcast out here in the street Amen. and shared with other people. Of course, we understand if there's abuse and things that happen where you need to involve somebody or you need counsel, that's a different story. But I would say if you're going to get counsel, don't go to somebody that's been married five or six times about marriage because something hasn't been working right. And I don't mean that in a degrading way whatsoever. I have relatives that have gone through that uh, that now are totally, fully as far as I know, happily married, uh, but there were a lot of things along the way. And then where all that stands and everything else, I hate to even think about or imagine. So, do not turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known. Now, we've watched people over the years who, for the sake of my position, which could become a God, or, you know, I always wanted to pursue this lifestyle, which can become a God, uh, they've turned out of the way of serving the Lord. 
In other words, I don't have to do that anymore and I'm okay. We see this all the time with folks. And we're always trying to say, listen, that's why as we're preparing for the coming of the Lord, we've got to be more and more sure that we're steadfast in his ways, that we're keeping his commandments, that we're loving him more than loving anything else out here in the world. And always remember, if you love him more than you love your own family, he's able to keep your family. He's able to restore your family. He's able to bring them to a place of repentance you could never bring them to. Nobody ever says don't love your family and love your children or any of those things. But even Jesus himself gave a scripture where he says that if you love these things more than me. So we just have to pay attention that we always are to keep him first. Just like we say in a relationship between a husband and a wife. It's a threefold relationship. There's him and her and the Lord in a godly marriage, right? So in your family, if he's the head of your family, he's involved in your family. Your relationship with your son and daughter, it's you and him and the Lord. It's you and her and the Lord. Because the Lord is always instructing us on how to deal with these things and how to walk in these things. Because he loves us. Because he doesn't want to see families destroyed and ravaged. He doesn't want to see people suffer under the things that so many have thrown themselves under. So he says, do not go out of the way. And some may be listening this morning online, and again, maybe some here. You've already gone out of the way. Some have learned from some of those things. Some have a heart or something in them that is always trying to take them out of the way. You should remember that the Bible says that uh, if it's a rebellion, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft in the Bible. And so you might hear somebody pray for somebody and pray about a spirit of witchcraft. Don't be offended at that. Realize God knows what he's doing. God knows where people go. He knows what's going on in their heart that you and I don't necessarily know. And for them to be set free once and for all, that the love of God can be manifest in their lives, they need freed from that because they may not make it into the kingdom. At least they come to a place of repentance. So not to go out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known. You know, when I was younger, I used to be afraid of being prosperous because I saw so many people that when they finally got prosperity, uh, they would, all of a sudden, they weren't going to serve the Lord anymore. None of that meant anything in their lives compared to what they're doing nowadays. And so you pay attention to that. And so I actually was afraid that if I prospered, I might go that way too. Because I came from a family where everybody prospered. So I understood that and I saw the family breakup and the fights and things between relatives and all of it came down to money. Money is the root of all evil, right? No, it's the love of money. You can have abundance and abundance and abundance to where you can't even count it all. Scrooge McDuck could sit in the vault and never know how much is really in there. But when you start loving it, there's a big difference. And today I say, Lord, you know, just to know that I'm somewhat able to provide and do what I need to do, I feel so blessed because we see so many people that can't walk in that right now. You look at some of the devastation that's going on. Is there judgments coming on our land because men have gone so far from the Lord? Are they walking so far out of the way and serving so many other gods? And yes, there's righteous and good people that suffer in the midst of that kind of stuff. God doesn't want any of that, but we bring those things on ourselves when we abort, what, 62 million or more babies in a course of time and We've destroyed what God said marriage is and say anybody can marry 
anybody or anything. When we talk about people marrying their pets or marrying their, uh, the one fellow wanted to marry his computer. I mean, what has happened in the minds of people? Well, the Bible says when you serve false gods, you'll have confusion. So they don't understand where they are and what they're doing. And we watch more and more of that. And in the midst of all of that, we should realize how blessed we are. Amen. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Why would you want to follow that when we're following the creator of heaven and earth? The one who was before the 6,000 years of human history began. He was there. And when what we're seeing right now is destroyed the earth and everything else, and he sets up his kingdom, as we talked about a Friday night, in the regeneration that's to come, we're going to sit with him in all of that. Why would we want to stoop to serve and, you know, the water gods? We were talking about with our, some of our family gathering yesterday, talking about some things. What a blessing even if it's only five minutes or so, but talk about there's the water God and there's the God of the wind and there's the God of the sun and there's the God of the baboon and there you are serving the God of the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the living. Amen. You've been blessed to know the truth. You walk in the midst of all these other people and you see how they live and what they do when we were in India back in the very first time I was there in the 90s when the people are drinking out of the river and down the river they're bathing in the river and down the river the cows are in the water and they're you know they don't hold back they have to go to the bathroom they go to the bathroom probably so do the little kids and upstream you're drinking the water or downstream you're drinking the water and then you wonder they're washing their clothes in the same water and live in that way and not knowing anything about how you live or what you have. And if they have filtered water, they're blessed. If they have electricity that runs all night long, they're blessed. And then you look at where we are and how we live. So verse 29 says, And it shall come to pass when the Lord thy God hath brought thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Mount Ebal. So in this, the Lord is showing us when they get, and if you follow the route, it sort of swings out to the east and then it starts coming back through Jordan there and they're going to cross the Jordan River and he says, when you get into the land, these two mountains, he said, one's going to be the one you're going to put the blessing on, Mount Gerizim. The other, Mount Ebal, you're going to put the curse. You all remember that? And some of you have been there on the Israel trips where we've gone by those mountains and they've shown you, look at uh, Ebal is still dead and disparaged. And then you look at Gerizim and there's trees and it flourishes somewhat and even more so in the springtime. Because one was the mount of the curse and one was the mount of the blessing. I don't know, do we have those pictures that we can put up? Yes? Why don't you go ahead and put, put them up and I'll go a little further here and thank you. If it works well, we'll work well. So today everything's working in here. The yellow room, we couldn't get anything functioning. The young people are watching the video and so on and then all of a sudden we got it figured out here right at the last minute or two. So... You know, we do this without any of this stuff. If this camera stops and we can't be online or any of those things, we're still going to have church. Amen. We're still going to worship the Lord. Still gather together. So put the blessing upon Gerizim and the curse on Ebal. Oh, yeah, here's the photo. You can see one side is Mount Ebal. You can see there's almost nothing on it. You can see Mount Gerizim on the other side, which is the Mount of Blessing. And there's trees and there's some livelihood there. Uh, and then the, the valley there, there's Shechem uh, down in the valley. So with that, let me ask you this. In your life, if uh, let's show those other 
there's two other photos there, if you can put one of them up. If you could have the choice, okay, they came up together, that's fine. You see, there's a house there. And for those of you that probably can't see this online, we'll post them on there if that's possible. But one of them is a mountain of cow dung up against the house like it's coming out of the window. And you think about the stench, you think about, you know, uh, the flies, you think about all these kind of things. And if you could think back about how many of you and I used to be and used to live, we were kind of living, that was our blessing. We had that pile of dung because we were in total opposition and out of the way of the Lord. And we had a lot of stench about us, maybe not a physical, literal smell, but in the nostrils of God, our lifestyle stunk. Amen. We had done what the Bible talks about. He had a place for us and a walk for us, a way for us, but we had missed that mark, which means we were living in sin because that's what sin means, missing the mark of what God intended for your life. You look at that pile of dung, you think, you know, a lot of people have even lost the realm of, uh, let's say, sexual relationship. They're so driven by sex that they will have sex with almost anything. That's all part of that dung pile. When they will love money so much, they'll go and damage anybody's life to have it. We've seen some of this in some of the products people have bought off the shelves that down the road they knew they caused cancer, they knew they caused uh, sterilization and so on, but yet for money and the love of money, they kept it going. For the love of money, people turn their heads and act as though they didn't see the results so that somebody can make money which they get a benefit from. That's all part of the stench of that dung pile. That would be Mount Ebal outside your window. And a lot of people today are living out there and know we don't rejoice in that and we don't look down on people in that because we once lived that way. Some of you may remember your own parents or somebody, a relative, saying to you, listen, you were raised much better than this. You were taught much better than this. We took you to church so you would know better than this. Yet somehow you kept falling into that dung pile. You kept coming out with that stench. Oh, you put that, you know, when we were in India, like I mentioned earlier, when the witch doctor walked down the street right in the midst of the big fancy stores with all the glitz and glamour, there he was with cow dung in his hair. That's what they used to keep it propped up. I know I mentioned those little pokes sticking up earlier that you had to have to be in fad today. I don't think that's involved whatsoever. But the witch doctor would take cow dung and use it to prop his hair up in these prongs. And he'd walk down the street. And of course, when he first did it, it stunk horrible. And there's a guy in a loincloth walking around in the midst of what looks like New York City from the front. There's the dung pile. He serves another God. He's confused. He doesn't understand. He doesn't know. He's into a power and a force that you and I are actually warring against all the time. Spiritual warfare, principalities, and powers of darkness. And then you look at what it shows with Gerizim there. Those look like bars of gold, but I think if you took your pen and took that picture and wrote on each one of those bars, friendship with God, joy, peace, rest, well-being, uh, perfect, you know, maturing in the Lord, growing in grace. We talked about on Friday night some of those things. Walking with the Lord, knowing Jesus, being known by God. We love the song, He Knows My Name, but does He really? Or do we sit and talk with Him, or do we just throw our requests at Him? 
You treat him like he's Santa Claus. Hey, what do you want for Christmas, kid? Well, I want, and then I want, and then I want. Oh, oh, by the way, what's your name? Because we'd have to put your name on those packages. We'd never get them. And some people go to God the same way. So you look at those gold bars and you think of prosperity, but we're talking about you may never own a gold bar in your life, but you possess wealth beyond most people's understanding and imagination because he reveals himself, he reveals wisdom and knowledge to us. That's what he's done for every one of us. When I think about where I was educationally and what I was about going on in life, to what I'm blessed to be allowed to do, and I may not be the best at it. But my heart is to do what the Lord has put here for us to do, and I hope yours is too. That's why it's good to be a part of the body of Christ like you're supposed to be and be in the fellowship. So you can choose Mount Ebal, which was a curse, or you can choose Mount Gerizim, which is the blessing. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. So when you take Mount Ebal and that picture of the dung, and you think that's the counsel of the ungodly, try the shoe on before you wear it. You know, if they won't give you what you feel you're worth, take it. Uh, you know, th this whole thing of where society's going, everything is upside down. Because so many people are serving gods of self. They're serving this god of rebellion. Uh, you know, the war god and all these other things. That they are so confused. They have no idea where they're going. You and I have the truth. That's in Christ Jesus. So it shall come to pass when the Lord thy God hath brought thee into the land. Whither thou goest to possess it. Thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim. That's the prosperity and the blessing, which may never look like financial blessing. But in a sense, when you read further in this covenant that he made with Israel, he said the rain will come and water your crops. That's prosperity. Yep. He said what you need in its season will be there for you. He said I'll drive your enemies out from before you so you don't have to go to war. So you can have what I've given you. He says, put the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Ebal. Are they not on the other side of Jordan? So listen, what he's saying is, when you get into the promised land on the other side of Jordan, you're still always going to have the choice, as you and I do, we were outside of the gospel and now we're in the gospel. We were outside of the kingdom and now we're in the kingdom. We were aliens to the commonwealth of Israel and now we are a part of the blessing with Israel. He says when you cross over Jordan and you're in the land, he says remember these two things. All the way through this walk, you have a choice of blessing or curse of Gerizim or evil all through the way? Are they not on the other side of Jordan? So you're not there yet, but when you get in there, make sure you identify them. By the way, where the sun goeth down in the land of the Canaanites, which dwell in uh, the Champaign over against Gelgal beside the plains of Mora. Okay, and then let's go back to verse uh, 26 through 28. Because he said, A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments. With that, always being mindful as we looked at that little picture there that represents gold, that your blessing and my blessing is not anything we have outwardly. It's all what is within us. So when you were sad, you were distraught, 
You felt like your life had no value, no meaning. All of a sudden you have meaning. You walk in confidence now because the Bible says uh, strong confidence have all those who fear the Lord. So now we walk confident in who we are in Christ Jesus. Many of the folks in the world act as though they're confident. And many of that is a, most of that is a front that covers an inferiority. I have to keep this front up or you won't believe me. We don't have to keep a front up because it's real in us or should be real in us. Amen? Amen? Amen. So these things are very important to know. So in Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 11, <clears throat> Well, let me, let me just give you verse 9, too, because in verse 9, he, Moses says, Hear, O Israel, this day thou art become the people of the Lord thy God. Anybody in here today, the people of the Lord thy God? You serve in the Lord? Are you blessed in the sense of what we're talking about? Do you understand that you're blessed in these things? Yes. That you're to keep with the blessing and obedience to the Lord? So Deuteronomy 27, verse 11 through 26, verse 9, he said that you have today become the people of God. You and I have become the people of God, according to the scripture, because we believed on the one that he has sent. Verse 11 says, and Moses charged the people the same day, saying, these shall stand upon Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Blessing, to bless the people when you are come over Jordan. And so Moses charges Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin to go and stand on Mount Gerizim and bless the people when they come in. Okay? And he says in verse 13, And these shall stand upon Mount Ebal to curse. Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulon, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levites shall speak and say unto all the men of Israel with a loud voice, with a loud voice. Why does sometimes the word come with a loud voice? Because there's a message that you've got to get. Amen. He didn't say whisper or just tell it to him he said stand there and proclaim these things with a loud voice how many of you've ever leaned over to one of your grandchildren and just said or to your wife or your husband i love you yes. look at how much of the scripture here talks about the blessing one verse and then we're going to go through all the rest of that he talks about the curse and he says don't just say it Say it with a loud voice because people need to know what they have to stay away from. People need to know the traps of the enemy, the snares of the enemy. They need to know that the devil wants to bring you and I down in any way he can. I love you. But look at what he says. The Levite shall... Uh, speak and say unto all the men of Israel with a loud voice, Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or more, uh, molten image an abomination to the Lord. Cursed be he that setteth light by his father. Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark. Cursed be he that maketh the blind to wander out of the way. Cursed be he that perverteth judgment. Listen, our society today, so many people are deceived because the judgments have been perverted. Amen. What's evil has been made to look good. And what's good, they've portrayed so much evil against it, you disdain it now. You don't even know the history of what's going on and why it's done. You want everybody to say to you, 
curse it. Be the man that perverts judgment. When the Lord says no, say it with a loud voice. Amen. What happened when, I remember sharing this a long time ago, my oldest granddaughter, she was three years old or so, maybe three and a half, we're at a park out in the country, and the road goes down both sides. You can go one way this way, the other way that way, whatever. And so she wasn't really being watched, and I saw her going over by the road, and then I saw her mother standing there, and I yelled with a loud voice because she's getting too close to the road. I could have said, get her. Which reminds me of, y'all remember my story about the bat in my bedroom? When I was a kid, the bat was on my bed, on my back. I had the blanket up over me. I had already heard it fluttering around in my window. Now he's on my back. And I'm about, I think I was eight years old, if I remember right, eight, nine, something. And my dad's in the next room over, so I'm going, Dad, Dad. And nothing's happening, of course, because he can't hear me. But when that thing started fluttering around on my back and I was really scared, I went, Dad! And all of a sudden, here he came with the tennis racket. <laughs> swatted that bat out of the air. <laughs> Saved me. I knew that bat was going to pick me up in that blanket and fly away with me and I'd never come back again. That just came right now. I never thought that before. But when I said it with a loud voice, I got a response. And I hope so many of you aren't bound in the thing of, well, Lord, help me, Lord Jesus. Because sometimes you got to speak. Amen. When devils are at your face, sometimes you got to declare the word of the Lord. Amen. you got to say Amen. some things with a loud voice when Amen. the gods of the world are trying to intermingle themselves in your relationship and where you are. you got to declare sometimes, no, I'm a child of the king according to the scriptures. Amen. No, I'm washed in the blood according to the word. That's why I say when we start praising God, I mean, that's nice. Maybe God does respect it the same and so on. But some things he said was shouts of joy and victory. There's a reason that's written in there. Your person needs to hear the shouts of joy. The spirit man really alive in you has to have some life sometimes. Sometimes if you'll pray in the spirit like that, you'll be shocked yourself because you allow the spirit of God to work in you Amen. to where suddenly you're realizing this ain't me doing this. I'm not just lifting up my voice. Something is going on. So he said, say with a loud voice, cursed be the man in verse 15 that goes that way. Cursed be he that setteth light by his father. That is where intimacies are exposed. That means somebody's really uh, mocking their father or their mother or putting light on some things that they have as shortcomings and weaknesses that you don't want to be doing. That's dishonoring your parents. I said to my, in fact, I just said this to my brother yesterday because somebody, uh, one of his kids posted a picture of him. He fell asleep in the chair and, you know, sometimes you make some facial contortions. And I said to my one daughter, listen, don't ever post pictures of me like that, please. You want to take them and have them and laugh about them? That's your business. But don't ever do that out in the open because it's disrespectful of who your parents are. It's disrespectful of who you are. Now, sometimes we may laugh, we fell, or we... Uh, when we were out here getting ready for a picnic, one of the young girls, I was pulling this big hay wagon all by myself, and suddenly we never knew that this one piece extends like telescopically, and all of a sudden it extended on me, and so it shot me backwards, and I flipped over backwards, I rolled up, shot my feet up in the air, and got up on my feet without anything happening. And she was laughing and pointing, and I'm sure it was funny, but my hair didn't get messed up, so I was all right. <laughs> but you don't go broadcast that kind of stuff. What happened with, with uh, Moses and the sons? Amen. So we see these kind of things. There's scripture. And so, so many of us 
learn these things in our early days, but listen, these folks aren't learning these things today. That's why you and I need to teach them all the time and instruct them. So he goes through the curses. One little verse he said about stand there on Mount Ebal and bless. And then, or excuse me, garrison and bless. And then all these about stand on evil and curse and curse with a loud voice so they know what not to do. Don't get too close to the edge of there. You could fall. Some of you were on the Israel trip. We went out in the desert there. We were on that big hill and all of a sudden the guides walking down the thing there and standing over there and turning around. I said to everybody, hey folks, don't go any closer. I was nervous and I was 50 feet away. Just to think that somebody would fall over something like that. You know, you're out in the desert. The wind can kick up any time. Look at what's happened with people standing on solid straight ground when these 100 mile an hour winds kicked up in the last week or so. Blew them all over the place. Who wants that kind of thing? So he says, cursed be in verse 19, he that perverteth the judgment. Cursed be he that lieth or lays down with his father's wife. Listen, this is relationships that aren't to be. There's so many of them mentioned in the scripture in the law that the Lord laid out. We, have, we should have no problem being clear about who we're to lie with. It should be your husband and your wife, one or the other, nobody else. Amen. And to pick a husband or a wife, he shows you through there, who you are not allowed to pick. Very clearly. Cursed be he that lieth with any manner of beast. Somebody says, well, some of these things are only written in one scripture in Leviticus. No, these things go through, they're woven through the whole scripture all the way to the end. Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with his sister. Cursed be he that lieth with his mother-in-law. Cursed be he that smiteth his neighbor uh, secretly. Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person. Somebody says, I'm a hit man. It's just my job. No, you're cursed. Because you take money, like it says here, to smite a neighbor secretly. Cursed be he that taketh reward, excuse me, to slay an innocent person. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law. How many people say, well, I believe the Bible, but I don't believe that part. Or, you know, you can tell me I have to do some of these, but don't tell me I have to do that. What does he say here? All of the things of the law. Amen? Amen. So we're to stand with all of those. So with this, we follow in chapter 28, because we're talking about blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, or standeth, and so on. Chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, verse 1 through 14, details the blessings of serving the Lord. Now, we haven't read through this for a long time. I know it's been at least 10 years probably since I went through it, and I'm not going to go through it today, but I want you to go through it and read them. 1 through 14 is the blessings, and that sounds like quite a bit of blessing. But when you look at the whole scripture and you see that verse six or 15 through 68 is the curses. So in reality, there's 14 verses of blessing and 53 that are the curses. He's told them to say the curses loud and clear so that you keep the people from erring from the truth. What do our young people need today? They need the authority in their lives. Amen. They need somebody that's going to tell them truth is truth and everything else is air. And yes, there are things that are absolute truth. And when he talks about, um, and, well, I'll wait till I think I'm going to get to it here, but I'll say it now. When he says about those who go their own way, those are people that declare and have had declared to them there's no absolute truth, so you don't have to follow anything. When you take history 
and you take real history and you change it like we're seeing so many people do today, you're saying you basically don't have anything to follow anymore. That's why they're doing what they're doing. The enemy's whole intent, like I've said so many times, why were there all these virgin births they talked about prior to the coming of Christ? Why were there those that they said were resurrected that were gods or mythology uh, gods and so on? Why was all that? Because the spirit of Antichrist has always been working in the world to misproport. And if you can put a fake up there before you bring the real, if people have fallen for the fake and they're disparaged, why would they be looking for the real? I probably shouldn't ask you this, but how many of you watch The Simpsons? If you watch The Simpsons, there's an episode where they did the rapture. And they mocked the rapture. And uh, is it Fred, I think? I don't watch it. I haven't watched it. I think I watched it twice in my whole life. But I think it's Fred or somebody uh, begins telling everybody about the rapture's coming, the rapture's coming, and here's when it's going to happen, and here's what's going to happen, and so on. And in the end of it, they're all saying, they're calling him foul names and saying, you lied to us. You're an idiot. This, that, and the other. Now, somebody who sits and watches that stuff over and over again, maybe you'll remember, this goes back 15 years ago, I talked about a fellow that was on one of the national uh, TV shows like uh, Phil Donahue or something like that. He was a Satan worshiper. And he mocked the rapture of the church, the catching away of the saints, and said that we'll be glad when they're gone because then we can live life the way we want to. So you got people like that. Then you got the Simpsons, the cartoon thing that puts so much stuff out there. And listen, if you watch some of these video movies and so on, or YouTube movies or TV movies, and you will see political agendas woven right in the midst of them all. And in that thing that somebody watches every night, they're on that same TV show. And tonight it's about, well, we can have babies out of wedlock and you gotta love us anyway. And down the road a couple more, it's like, well, you should hate anybody that's in charge. Then down the road, you should hate anybody that's prosperous. And it's all woven in the movies. This is a great day to start getting ready for the new year. Pay attention to what's happening because a lot of us are just walking through life like none of this is going on around us. And we're wondering why these younger folks have hatreds and animosity because it's being inbred in them while you're not paying attention and you're not really knowing to counter it. Why prayer is so important. We may not be able to reach anybody, but our prayers, God can reach anyone. God can take them right out of the worst pit, than, worse than ever you and I have ever been in, and bring them to saving grace. God can turn the light on in their life to where they've never even heard the gospel. But all of a sudden, the Lord manifests himself to them because of our prayer, because we're not foolish about the things that are going on in the world. We haven't acted as though evil has now disappeared and everything's going to be wonderful. All right, so where, where were we? 27? Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. 28 becomes the blessings and the cursings. He continues. Why? Because he wants them to know as he wants us to know. Why is it the foolishness of preaching? Just somebody standing up and preaching what's in this Bible can save your soul. Save my soul. Amen. I listened to an a Iranian lady giving her testimony, and she said she sat there, and I listened to these people talking about the Bible and the scriptures, and she said what I said. She went, oh, God, if this is true, I'm going to hell. That's where I was. I related to that. It's great to hear somebody that's open enough to say that kind of stuff anymore. 
Because all of a sudden we're all portraying ourselves, well, we just sort of slipped into the kingdom. I was good anyway. I just needed the Lord, I guess, to make it all complete. No, you needed the Lord because you were on your way to hell. Amen. You were damned in your sin according to the word of God. You had no other way out. You couldn't get yourself better. You might have stopped drinking, smoking up, shooting up, anything else, cheating on your wife or your husband. That don't get you in the kingdom of God. Gets you to the place where you better realize you need Jesus more than you ever did before. Amen. Because right. now you realize a lot of those things were sin, and if we won't acknowledge their sin, we still can't repent. If we can't repent... We won't get into the kingdom of God. The Bible talks about in the book of Revelation, in those days that are coming, there were men that even though all the judgments were coming upon them, he says they will not repent. The way he's describing it, they would not repent. And so we need to pay attention to all of that. So, the blessings... 14 scriptures, 53 of the troubles and the sorrows and the sadness. And so let's go back to what I said in the beginning. Whether you're in here listening and you may say I'm a believer or you're out there and maybe you're not a believer, you don't understand a lot of this. Are some of these things the very reason that you're sad? Are they some of the reasons you think I might as well end my life? Oh, don't do that. Because the end of that is not good. It's better to say, I'm not going to end my life and I'm going to change according to what the Bible says. I want that mount of blessing, not the mount of dung and curse. Amen. I don't want to have my life be a stench like it's been thus far. Christ is the one that came to change all of that. That's why the Bible said, Luke 4, Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for the very reason of saving our souls, the very reason of setting us free, the very reason of opening those very prison doors that have kept you in bondage to all of these things. So, Psalm 1, verse 1 through 3. Let me turn back to it. I might as well read it all clearly again. Blessed is the man that walks not in, walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. You've been obeying ungodly counsel. Some of our own sons and daughters have gone off in the way of things. They've disobeyed the counsel of the godly. They're walking in the counsel and the ways of the ungodly. And so, of course, they don't feel like they're worth anything. Of course, they don't feel like you and I who just submitted to the word of God and obey him. It's not an emotional feeling, but there is a feeling of justification. We're justified. Hey, search me, O Lord. Try me. If there be any wicked way in me, forgive me. Because I feel justified in the eyes of the Lord. I can be at peace with the fact if he looks on me, on me and finds things, he's not going to judge me in it. He's going to bring me out of it. Amen. He's going to show me the way out. Amen. He's going to make me stronger and better and more prepared for the kingdom when it comes. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth in the way of sinners. Hey, when I was sitting in the bars, I was sitting in the way of sinners. Some of these folks out here today selling their bodies and everything else at young ages, they're sitting in the way of sinners. They may sit in a room and wait till their number's called. All this kind of stuff, you think, well, geez, it's really that out in the open? Yeah, it's out in the, out in the open that much. When their number calls, that, that's when they go. They sit in the seat you know, stand in the way of sinners and not to sit in the seat of the scornful, which means to mock the things of God. Remember, we used to have that term goody two-shoes. We would mock people that did good, 
mock people and because we weren't so smart, we'd, mar uh, we'd mock the smart kids in school. What'd you call them? You called them nerds. Next thing you knew, they built spaceships. They built solar panels and systems that ran things and everything else. And you used to mock them. I talk about a fellow that grew up down the street from me. We used to always call him snot nose because when we played football and stuff, he always had snot running down his nose. I'm not going to mention the company he became the president of making, this was 25 years ago, making $350,000 a year. And there was me making 40 grand. And I called him snot nose. I guess he proved his case. Because then he went from that to even more and a bigger company. You know the names because they're all computer companies that you're very familiar with. He was in charge of them. And I used to play football with him. Today I'd probably have to go pick him up if he flew into the airport and drive him to his place and maybe he'd flip a quarter or a dollar to me or something. Nor sit in the seat of the scornful. And you know, that's why you never want to mock too much of anything. The Bible says we're not to judge anything before it's time. And so in all of our working together and with each other, we're not judging people where they are. We're judging some of the things we do because they can be the very obstacles that keep us from getting to the Mount of Blessing or seeing the blessing of the Lord that he talks about here in the scripture. So he says he shall be, or I'm sorry, his delight is in the law of the Lord. Those commandments. Realize that, Lord, you know what? You said if I give up anything for your namesake, I'll get it back 40, 60, 80, 100 fold, whatever it may be, in this life and in the life ahead that's coming for us. They were mocking me because I gave it up, and you're blessing me because I gave it up. Think about that. And then in the life to come, what's going to be manifest from everything you did? His delight is in the law of the Lord. If I keep myself and walk the straight and narrow path, first of all, I feel justified. Don't you? Amen. Sometimes you hear somebody say some things about you and you think, geez, I would never do that. There's a justifying feeling there because you're secure in the Lord. And now that doesn't mean if we gossip or lie or deceive or any of those things, we should feel justified. No, we should feel convicted and repent and change. Amen. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. What did Paul say in Philippians chapter 4 about think on these things? And he mentioned some of the ways of how to think and what to perceive them as. And then he said, these things which you have both seen and heard in me do, and the God of peace, he's going to keep you. Amen? Amen. And it says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, because that tree always has a draw. Do you know they say that if you take a tree, a plant, the garden vegetables and various things, and you don't give them any water for a period of time, and then they are searching for water with their roots. They're digging deeper. And so then when you pour water down there, those plants immediately suck it back up because now they have spread their roots further, grown roots. They're searching for water, and they identify with the water and immediately take it in. And so you have stronger plants and better production. Isn't that great? Anybody been through dry times in your life? Do you murmur and complain or do you say, well, Lord, thank you. I'm going to be stronger. I'm going to bear more fruit. This is going to work to my good in the long run. It was a little tough there. I was getting so parched. I thought maybe I was going to fall over as a corn stalk or a tomato plant or whatever the case. But now I know this is all your purpose and intent. So let's grow. Amen? Amen? He's like a tree planted by the water, rivers of waters that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. 
And listen, everybody, we have seasons in our lives. You may say, I haven't gotten to share the gospel with anybody. Pray for the season of sharing the gospel. Pray for the season of watering the word with somebody. Pray for the season of growing because, you know, in the fall, the leaves fall off the trees. They don't look so good, but they're still growing. They're still alive. And again, many times that's when their roots dig deeper in the dirt. And so then they're stronger against the storms when they come. That's why the pine trees fall over so easy. They've got shallow roots. His leaf also shall not wither. It means your hair won't change colors. <laughs> and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Amen. And chaff doesn't bear any fruit. It's the casing of the wheat. The wheat is what bears fruit. The wheat is what you and I use for food. But it's also what's replanted in the ground and brings forth more fruit. And I want to just refer, and you can go read this on your own, but Kings, the book of Kings, 2 Kings chapter 22 and verse 1 through 10. And remember, they didn't have the book of the law, but they found the book of the law. And when the book of the law was brought to the king, who was a godly king, he repented and he rent his garments, the Bible says. And so the Lord saw the tenderness of his heart. And he said, I will gather you to your fathers before I bring this to pass. That means he'll pass from this life before I bring these judgments upon the land. Again, I just want to say, because as I read these things, and I know a lot of folks, I know we've had some folks here, but many of these other folks in other churches and prayer meetings and things that I've been in, they've had loved ones go home to be with the Lord. The Bible says about the righteous who perish and no man lays it to heart. It talks about how they're escaping their troubles, and sometimes we don't want them to escape without us. And I can fully understand that. And think like, yeah, but the Lord knows what he's doing. Amen. And we may say, well, this might not look like it's the Lord or look like the Lord brought this about, but he knows how to save us out of all those things. And again, I'll say that so many of these folks, even folks listening in today, who've seen some of your loved ones go home to be with the Lord, rejoice, although you, you're saddened, you miss and Sometimes you feel the grief or the separation and so on. Amen. You wonder about your own life and where you'll be. Uh, the Lord will keep you. He's faithful to what has been committed to him. And if they haven't committed you to the Lord, we do in our prayers. So the Lord will keep you. But they've gone to rest. So in 2 Kings 22, the king was allowed to go home and escape before the judgments came. I don't know if many of you would say, I sure hope that happens with me before all this other stuff happens. Well, listen, if it doesn't happen, the Lord knows he can get you through. Amen. We need to know that and rest in it. And I don't want to sound like I'm preaching a doomsday message, but listen, if doomsday stuff starts happening, pay attention. The Lord is with you. Walk in the counsel of the godly. Sit in the seat of those who praise. And stand in the way with those who walk with the Lord. And you will be blessed. Amen? Amen. We're going into a season in time. Could be your season to bloom. Could be your season of fruit. Can be your season to grow and Put out leaves and fruit like you've never done before. It's all a matter of will you choose the blessing? Will you choose to obey the commandments of the Lord? Will you let yourself serve God in ways now that maybe you have always reserved yourself from 
in the past. And again, I might have talked about this Friday or last Sunday. Are there things you need to cast off and things you need to put on? Because that's what the scripture tells every one of us. Amen? Amen. So, Father, I thank you for this word today. I thank you how it's affecting lives now. Amen. I thank you that it's dividing soul and spirit Amen. in the name of Jesus. It's bringing forth life. I give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor for these things. We just want to thank you and worship you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you all for listening this morning. If you haven't recommitted yourself, made sure your calling and election is sure as we talked about.